We started so formally. So I, first of all, I want to I want to relax. This is supposed to be a fun meeting, and uh, I just want to say thank you to Elon, who is still the director of ELSEC uh, for the, during the last uh, seven years or something. Uh, he we really owe him a lot. Uh, uh, for bringing up uh, not only taking the, the previous uh, interdisciplinary center for neural computation, was here for 20 years and educated a lot of good people, many of them are here, uh, and actually turned it in the, in, during the last uh, seven years into, into what we hope to be really a, a world-class uh, brain science center, ELSEC, and, uh, which is also the main uh, supporter of this meeting and uh, of course, all the organization here is done by ELSEC people, especially Alona, who is somewhere running around. And uh, so really, without this, we couldn't really make this meeting. So I, I gave myself a few more minutes, as you can see, because I want to say just something about the, the scope and, and the, the goal of this meeting before I start my own talk. So first of all, it's really all my fault in the sense that I, I really wanted and I thought that it's about time to bring together uh, those different communities, first of all, uh, neuroscientists, I mean, uh, especially what you call computational neuroscientists or theoretical neuroscientists, who are actually uh, who are trying to understand the brain, but in order to do this, we, we essentially use every, every good idea around, in some sense. I mean, we really need to combine different disciplines and different methodologies. And the whole idea of the center is really around this. I mean, bring together people with different types of knowledge and different types of disciplines and different types of technical abilities. And of course, the other two communities, which are the essential ingredients of this meeting, are actually two branches of engineering, uh, control theory and information theory. Uh, or even two branches of today mostly electrical engineering, but which somehow grew out of their original practical domains. I mean, information theory is about, started as a theory of communication, but actually the name information theory was already very controversial, as I will say later, in the sense it actually hinted that it, it talks about much more than communication. And the history of information theory is one of the most fascinating topics uh, in, in the history of science and engineering in general. It has so many ups and downs and haters and lovers, and it's still a very controversial uh, issue, even here, here inside our center and obviously in many other places, because it's a very funny theory in a sense, which I'll elaborate a little more later. The other one, control theory, starts from, again, a very practical question. I mean, how do I control the temperature in this room? Or, or how do I uh, maneuver an airplane? Or how do I uh, build an autonomous vehicle? I mean, these are all problems where you actually have to act and do something. And, and uh, in order to do it well, you need some sort of a theoretical foundation. Uh, and it grew out out of entirely different discipline, which is really the theory of uh, dynamical systems, mechanics, uh, the theory of things that move and change with time. And the fact is that these two entirely different branches of science or engineering <coughs> really have uh, much more in common and similar than most engineers appreciate. Uh, and uh, that's really, uh, uh, not only that, they turn out that together, in some sense, understanding what information is, how information is transferred from one person to the other, how information is used, how much information is needed, and so on, in order to behave and in order to control uh, other, other devices is really also the fundamental question, not only in engineering and in what we call today data science and its newcomer, uh, discipline which really took over everything which is called machine learning. All of them are essentially some sort of uh, blend of ideas that come from statistics, information, and control, which is the theory of actions and behavior. And of course, these are the fundamental aspects of uh, what we call now intelligent systems. Uh, in particular, what we another term which became very trendy recently, computational intelligence, which is uh, 
the idea of really how to not only understand the intelligent, biological intelligence, but also and in tandem with it, understanding and how, how to build artificial and uh, machines and devices that behave in an intelligent manner. So the realization that I have for many, many years that these three disciplines, I mean, artificial intelligence or in its new form, uh, machine learning <coughs> or some aspects of it, together with understanding the flow and, and manipulation of information, or what we sometimes call even computation, and combining it with the art of understanding behavior and actions and planning and so on, decision making, it's not only a very uh, an exciting uh, new topic that is emerging together in some sort of a synergetic way. I mean, the combination of those three together is much more than the way it's one of them separately. Uh, that it's also really the, the basic, uh, maybe most fundamental question behind the uh, brain science and understanding the brain. And I really believe that without, without the combination of these three theories, we cannot understand the brain. I think that at least here in Jerusalem, people agree with this, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> now, uh, so there are all sorts of technical issues here. I, I, so the scope, again, as I said, I mean, was trying to bring together those three communities which not too often meet together. And, and I really intend as much as possible to force all of you to be as much as possible in all the talks. So we actually mixed the, the, the program is, is really a, a blend of more or less coherent sessions, but in a way that should be open and accessible to everybody. So the morning is more or less the fundamental theory. Uh, which what I call the connection between information and control, and of course learning is everywhere behind. But then we, we have a, a very exciting session this afternoon, uh, which is going to focus on the neuroscience aspects, uh, by very really very seminal, very important people uh, in this field. Uh, and actually, one of my my really pride reasons to be proud in this meeting is that we managed to bring to bring here people who have never been to Israel before. And are really uh, leaders, uh, or some of them have never been to Israel before, leaders of the, in the field and really the best people we could think of. And, and actually the, the response to our invitation was so, so successful that we didn't have enough room for the local uh, experts eventually, but I'm sure we'll find other opportunities for them. So next, the, the afternoon session is really highly recommended session on, uh, which will have some sort of a blend of neuroscience talks in this context. Tomorrow morning, we are going to talk about cognition and embodiment. So essentially, how, is, how are these things linked in, in the real world in some sense, in the physical world? And we're going to have talks about birds, about autonomous cars, about uh, what do we mean by embodiment theoretically, and, and, uh, and uh, whether, in what sense, information is really the driver of cognition. Why, why do you really care about information? And then again, the afternoon talk is going to focus more or less on what I call neural coding and representation. And again, some sort of a blend of theory and uh, experimental and data. So this is one of those sessions that I, I wish all of you will attend. And Wednesday, again, is, is, uh, is uh, another take on, on the same notion of decision making and behavior. And eventually, uh, one session on the adaptation and its connection to predictability. And I hope that by the end of the week, we'll all be, we'll all be much happier, certainly much more exhausted. But uh, so we are looking forward to a really exciting meeting. OK, so now I'll start my own talk. And there are all sorts of technical issues here, which I hope will work. So uh, I'm going to attempt to somehow uh, give some sort of an introduction uh, to those who really don't know what we're talking about while still bring you my own views of the issue here. So, so the talk has essentially three parts. And as all of you know, I never get to, my, to the end of my talks. But uh, uh, so I, I'm going to, to start by essentially combining uh, information and control, uh, in some sense, uh, reviewing Shannon theory in somewhat new light, and then connect it to the fundamental questions of control through something which I call predictive information and I believe is really the key to the link between these two theories. And then I'm going to, to talk a little bit about problems that we solve with, with this type of idea. So, so don't take too, the outline too seriously. 
So essentially, the story that we are talking about starts with uh, Claude Shannon, wh whom I'm sure you heard about. And, and this is one of those famous uh, pictures of Shannon more or less in, in his 30s during the time that he actually published or uh, worked on, on the question of information, of communication. As some of you may know, uh, Shannon worked at, finished his master's at MIT at the late 30s and then was essentially hired by, by the, the government to work at Bell Labs at the time that worked for the US government and was essentially posed with questions which has to do with cryptography or with uh, transmitting secret information from one point to the other. <laughs> and this was really his, his task, I mean, understanding uh, how to encrypt and decipher and break codes. And while thinking about this problem, he actually came up with some very fundamental ideas that originally had very little to do with encryption per se, but turned out later on to be uh, the fundamental aspects of not only communication theory, so, so actually, so, so the story of, of information theory, as far as I'm concerned, actually starts a bit earlier in 1942 when Shannon had uh, this uh, mysterious paper about the mathematical theory of secrecy systems. Uh, which this paper was actually classified until 1960, more or less. And only after the war in 1947, 8, 9, uh, in a series of technical reports at Bell Labs, and actually a lot of arguments with reviewers, <laughs> Eventually, they managed to get out uh, this paper, which is now called the Mathematical Theory of Communication, where Shannon actually had this uh, important sketch of what he called the model of communication. And his model of communication was essentially uh, the simplest. I mean, Shannon was a physicist, if you ask me, although he was considered an engineer. And the way he was thinking was always simplify things as much as possible until you really get to the essence of things. And in that sense, I call him a physicist, although most engineers will not agree with him. He was interested in engineering questions, but the way he, he uh, formulated things was very much uh, in the spirit of get simple models and simple concepts first. And uh, so he said, okay, what is communication? Essentially, we have some sort of information source, some, some, someone who's trying to communicate with a receiver or is on the other side and some, some destination. And, we essentially send some sort of physical signals, like my uh, speech sound right now, between my source of information, which is somewhere hidden in my brain, more or less clear, and, and your destination, which is also hidden in your brain somewhere. And in between, there's all sorts of uh, transformation this signal is going through, which he called eventually the transmitter, originally the transmitter and the receiver. So there's some sort of processing that goes from the ideas in the source through a physical channel, a physical source of communication where everything turns into something completely different, like sound waves in this case, or like elect electrons um, flowing in, in, in wires and so on in, 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 so many, in so many different ways. And essentially, Shannon had this very clear intuition at first that the actual the physical details of this channel shouldn't really be so important. What is important is something else. And eventually, he had uh, some very fundamental uh, insights, which I, I want to review with you. First of all, that the channels essentially use only discrete symbols. So even though the channels go through continuous physical things like sound waves or electric currents or whatever, uh, essentially there are discrete distinguishable symbols that are statistically distinguishable and statistically important. This was actually the, the, the first of what we now call the digital revolution. I mean, the, the digital age. And this was really a revolution at the time, that people communicate through symbols which are discrete, although language was like that all the time, but nobody really noticed that this is such a fundamental thing. So every channel, every physical channel is essentially discrete. What are these symbols and how they are used was a very, uh, a very one of the main questions. And then you realize that the only thing that really matters for the communication problem about the, the source is not the meaning and not the depth and not the content of, of the source, but something which he more or less invented. It's not he didn't really invent it, but he rediscovered a concept which was called, he called the source entropy or entropy rate, which is essentially how much you really, what is really the essential content in the sense that you cannot reduce it anymore and you cannot compress it anymore. So it's what we call 
min minimize the redundancy of the source as much as you can, and without getting into technical details, those of you who know, know, and those of you who don't know will not get it now, there is some function of the statistics of the source that the only which determines its entropy rate, essentially how many really distinguishable things I need to transmit. And this is the only thing you really needed to know about the source at that point, and actually that caused a lot of confusion already because people thought, okay, so you don't care about content, you don't care about meaning, and information theory has no semantics and so on. This is all nonsense. <laughs> what he said that in order to solve the problem of communication, I really need to care only about entropy rate. And then he said, okay, the channel, those, this physical channel between the, the two sides of the communication is also characterized by only one important number, which is known as the channel capacity, which is essentially what is the maximal number of symbols which you can always write as, as binary symbols. Actually, there's also very delicate issues as bits per second. What is the maximum rate that you can transfer through the channel without errors, in some sense, without confusions? And that's exactly why you need to discretize the channel because you don't want those symbols to, to, to overlap, to mix together. So, and this number again, a single number, which you also measure in the same units, bits per second or rates of information. And this is the only thing he needed to know about the channel in order to answer the question, can we communicate at this rate? So this, this source can communicate at this rate through this channel. So at this point, and this point had some, some very insightful like, uh, realizations. Essentially, there are two separate issues here. One of them is how to remove the redundancy from the source which eventually was called data compression, or essentially leave out all the unnecessary re repetitions and, and things that we can actually guess from the source itself. And so data compression or source coding became one important problem. And the other one which in general realized essentially is an independent problem, how do you surround this physical channel with something which she called source, uh, channel coding or error correction code we essentially remove the noise or overcome the noise in the channel. And from that point on, this, for, for a, very many, many, a long time, these two questions became separate. Essentially, the channel became an entity of its own, which has, so the physical channel is what we call the, the channel coding and the channel decoding, which essentially some sort of tricks, mathematical tricks, that allow you to overcome internal noise in the channel. And the point, the point of channel was that even if there's very high noise in the channel, as long as there's some very little correlation between the input of the channel and the output of the channel, I can still transfer information without errors at some limited rate, which is known as the capacity. Okay, I'm sure that many of you know that. But then, this actually again caused one of the main difficulties, because this trick of separating the source coding or the compression problem from the channel coding or the error correction problem didn't come for free. It has a cost, and the cost was essentially uh, uh, this separation property was essentially uh, you can do it only asymptotically in general. So you need really long, very long blocks, which will introduce very long delays in order to achieve the optimal compression and the optimal error correction. And this is one of those points where communication or, or information theory became in some sense asymptotic or non-instantaneous, which made it a little bit weird for people like control people who are thinking about differential equations and things that change in time very quickly. And that's again one of those points where a lot of people think, okay, information theory is not for me, it's only asymptotic, I have the, only have to think about very long blocks and so on. But actually, Shannon himself realized that, so in general, okay, so, with this assumption that I can actually separate the channel coding from the source coding, he came to, to this very important conclusion that communication is possible if and only if, asymptotically, the rate of the source is smaller or equal to the capacity of the channel. So essentially, he, brought, he transformed the question of whether I can communicate through any physical channel into a comparison of two numbers. One is the source entropy rate, and the other one was the capacity of the channel, and that's it. That's given the complete answer with some more or less rigorous proofs to, to, to this statement, that if I can do this, everything, that's all I need to know about communication. Okay, but of course, 
as I said, the, the price of non-instantaneous communication, I mean, the fact that in principle I need very, very long blocks, which means very, very long delays, already made the whole thing somewhat useless for some people, especially those who really like to think about instantaneous action all the time. But it turns out that there was a, a slight condition there that was emphasized later on by other people, that in some special cases, uh, I don't need those delays. I can actually achieve optimality instantaneously, immediately. And all of you know something about uh, information code theory and codes know that, for example, if the probabilities of the source are precisely integer powers of one half, then which we what we call dyadic uh, source, like eight, quarter, half, and so on, uh, if these are all the probabilities of, of messages in my source, then I can build an optimal code which can be used optimally with bits, with, with bits exactly, because every sequence of finite sequence of bits correspond to a certain probability in my source. And in this case, it's actually a very simple case where we call the match, there's a matching between the source probabilities and the channel alphabet in this case, bits. So this is a very special case. I don't need blocks then. OK, so this one I wanted to notice because we're actually going to come back to this issue of how. So in some cases, in some special cases, very special cases, the source and the channel are matched together. OK, I have to hurry up a little bit. So this was only the beginning of channel theory, the second, which was published in 1949 in this seminal paper, the Mathematical Theory of Communication. But already there, it was clear to Shannon that the real problem of communication cannot be lossless, cannot be without losing anything. There must be something else which you have to consider in theory, which is the fact that in principle, I mean, when you hear me now, you don't hear perfectly that definitely what I think about, but even what I'm saying, there's some noise. Essentially, there's some distortion in the way you hear me and the way you perceive me. And as long as the distortion is small or is tolerable, then you're OK. So communication should be what, with what Shannon calls fidelity criteria. I mean. What can I, how can I compromise the, the rate of communication with the tolerable distortion? And the distortion could be anything. I mean, whatever you consider important distortion. So essentially, if I take this abstract, abstract uh, model of Shannon, uh, there's a source, there's a decoder, encoder, which essentially turns it into some uh, alphabets of the channel in some sense. And then there's a channel, which may have noise. And then there's the decoder, and there's the server. So if I made it slightly more abstract, uh, I, I call the source X, and I call the sender Y, the receiver Y. Was X of Y of course supposed to be some some version of X, in, in general. I mean, some distort, maybe distorted version of X. There is an intermediate phase which I call X hat, which is some sort of an internal representation or some sort of channel representation of the source, which is sufficiently sufficient in order to generate from it Y in a good enough way, which means. OK, I'm willing to distort my source a little bit, but I still want to recover something close enough to it or useful enough to it, which I call Y. So essentially, uh, I can uh, now, uh, so essentially, with, I can add these things. I mean, so there's some sort of distortion measure between the input and the output. This is something I want to minimize. This distortion can be acoustic distortion, optical distortion, motor distortion, whatever you have in mind. I want to minimize this. But there's also a cost associated with the channel itself. I mean, it ca it's cost me something to transmit information to a channel. It can be energy, it can be length, it can be time, it can be computation, it can be many things. I just assume here for simplicity that it's a function of the current symbol that goes through the channel. OK, so uh, what is, and, and then Shannon came up with some very in important generalization of his original theory. Instead of thinking about the rate of the source, I'm thinking about the rate required for a certain distortion, and call this the rate distortion function, which essentially is the minimum mutual information, and I, I don't define it now, I'll define it later, between my source and my representation of the source, subject to all possible maps that obey my distortion criteria. And of course, here there's a separation assumption, and the channel capacity is now turned into something else, which is the channel as a function of the cost. How much what is the maximum number of bits I can transmit through my channel at a given energy or at a given cost of transmission? And, and then he, he had what I call Shannon's 
ingenious miracle or trick. Uh, with, essentially, he could transform the, the physical problem. What is the cost of transmitting a certain distortion? I mean, this is really what you care about. You're given a certain distortion. You're asking how much I have to pay for this distortion, average distortion. Essentially, he turned it into a, a question of comparing two numbers, which are essentially information theoretic. Compare the rate distortion function to the com capacity cost function. So there's one function which is always up, upward concave, and the other one which is always downward convex, and, uh, and actually vice versa, never mind. <laughs> Essentially, give me the distortion, and you want to know what is the minimal cost I have to pay for this distortion. I have to go through the rate distortion function, which is in principle can be calculated if I know the source, and then calculate what for this. For this to happen, what is the capacity, the minimal capacity I need to, to have in order, and that this gives me the minimal cost that I have to pay. So this is something quite remarkable. I mean, it turned a, a very complicated physical question. What is the minimal distortion at a given cost of communication, which in principle could have many, many different models and solutions depending on the physical properties of the channel, the physical properties of the source, and so many other things, and the distortion itself, into again, comparing two numbers, the rate as a function of the capacity, and the capacity as a function of distortion and the cost. So this is something which I call Shannon's miracle, or Shannon's uh, trick. And he, of course, was well, well aware of it. I'm not going to read all this. This is at the end of his, his really last most important paper, the 1959 paper, where he actually realized that these two questions, communicate, source coding with distortion and capacity with cost, are very closely linked together. Essentially, they are dual to each other. In one case, we minimize the information, and the other case, we maximize the information. You know, minimize the information under the distortion constraint and maximize the information under the source constraint. One of them is going to give you the capacity, the other one is going to give you the, the, the distortion function. And then he said at the end of the paper, a passage which I really find very inspiring, especially for this, for this meeting, this duality should be pursued further because they are closely linked to the connection between control and knowledge. We can control the, the future. We, we, can, we may control the future, but have no knowledge of it. We know the past, but have no control of it. And that's, in my opinion, one of those instances where Shannon essentially told us what to do. Push it into control. So I, I'm going to run out. I'm really very slow on my slides, of course. But uh, so I want to take this uh, Shannon communication model in, in its very abstract form, source encoding channel representation decoding uh, receiver, and I call it x, x hat y. And essentially, we have uh, two maps between them. One of them is, how do I transform the source symbols into the representation, which in general can be stochastic? And how do I trans, so there's, there's a, a compression channel here, and there is a channel, a communication channel, or prediction channel on, on the other hand, and of course, Instead of assuming that I know the distortion function, let's generalize it a little bit and assume that you have some access to the joint distribution of x and y. Notice that I really generalize the notion of distortion here. So instead of giving you what is the minimum distortion, I, let's say that I want to obey certain statistics, any statistics, between x and y. And x and y should not really be just source and receiver, I mean, my, 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 my speech and, and your, your interpretation of it, but can become something completely different. It can be my sensory information and my actions, or my, my uh, whatever. I mean, I can hear one thing and do other things. I can receive X, which can be anything, and, and do Y, which can be other thing completely. It's still it was exactly with the same, the same idea, but now I can throw away the Shannon's model completely, and I have a, a nice way of thinking about this in a completely abstract way. I essentially ask, what is then the optimal intermediate representation or internal representation? If you think about the brain, x is the sensory inputs, x hat is some sort of an internal representation of the inputs, and y is some sort of actions, and it obeys on exactly the same principle. So the question I, I ask myself, together with many others, so what, what characterizes Shannon's model in some sense, in some very general sense, what is this x hat, in what, what sense this x hat is internal representation, this channel representation in, in his communication model, in, in, in what sense it's optimal in general? And uh, so it turns out that it has a, a very elegant or nice answers, not one. One of them, so it's optimal if this internal representation, x hat, 
allows me to, to preserve as much as possible of the mutual information. I mean, how much X actually tells about Y. And this, of course, depends only on the joint distribution of the two. So this is one answer. If I could preserve as much as possible of mutual information, then in some sense, optimal. I also want to do it in the most efficient way, which means that I want this X hat to be as simple or as short as possible. OK? The other one, so this, this actually is directly related to a very a, a classical concept in statistics known as minimal sufficient statistics. It turns out that this precisely happened. I preserve all the information if and, and in the shortest possible way, if and only if this x hat is a minimal sufficient statistics of x with respect to y. And y is the parameter of distribution or anything else that you want. The other answer, which is again very, I found it very intriguing, it happens precisely when this, the compression and the channel which I always denote here by blue and red, if you notice, uh, the, the, the compression of the, of, the, of the past, the sensory information, and the, the prediction of the future, channel, channels co coding in some sort of prediction because I, I'm sending my information through an unknown stochastic channel. I have to predict, I guess in some sense, what's going to come out of it. And so this is a future-looking property. And if these two are matched in the perfectly matched sense that I mentioned before, that I can, the channel and the, and the source are matched together, then this is another necessary and sufficient condition for optimality in exactly the same sense that I mentioned before. And this will also allow me communication with no delays. If you believe me that match, if I match the channel to the source, I can use the trick, essentially achieve optimality with no long delays, no block coding. So this is very nice. In some sense, the answer to this question, I mean, when uh, is the compression and the communication are matched together, are optimal, is related both to a statistical, fundamental statistical question of minimal sufficiency and to a fundamental communication question of matching sources and channels. And of course, my uh, claim to fame is that the whole thing is related to something which I call the information bottleneck self-consistent equation. In some sense, the choice and the channels, these two distribution, the red, the blue and the red, the compression term and the prediction term must be related self-consistently through these two simple equations. <laughs> this one essentially is sending the channel in some sort of average of the compression based on the statistics of the world of the, of the x and y. And the other one is telling me, OK, the compression <coughs> should be somehow related to the source through this Kullback library divergence, which again, I'm not going to define today, but uh, some of you know it already. So some sort of the distance between between the, the source itself, it's a it compressed channel. And if these two equations are self-consistently satisfied together, then I'm in if and only if these two other things. I have an approximate sufficient statistic, and how much approximate depends on this parameter beta, and, and I have, and I have a, a, a match source and channel. Yes? Why do you have the x in x hat instead of the x hat? Just to make it simple. I mean, of course, you can use base rule and, and invert it. But I, I didn't want to write px hat here. So this is just base out of a replace px. I change this term, the normalization term. Use base rule, and you get exactly the same type yeah, of thing. The so these two things are, this is the only independent thing here. px hat is determined from it, and py given x hat is determined from it through this. So these are really the independent variables. But they have to be, so the channel and the source have to match in some very fundamental sense. I just wanted to make it simple. So this is exactly the point in my talk where I can really link control and information. So again, if you, I want to move quickly to the question of control. So you're going to hear a lot more talks about control theory than information theory in this talk, in this meeting. But so I really wanted to spend some time about the information theoretical issues. But usually when you talk about, so Shannon, of course, was, this is one of my favorite pictures of Shannon, where he built this maze and, uh, and autonomous uh, mice, mouse that, that was able to solve the maze automatically. This, is, this he did in 1956, which is quite amazing. Uh, so he had this electronic uh, maze solver. And uh, so he was obviously interested in behavior and control, and he said it all his life. You know, he was a very, a very, a very talented juggler. He really liked to move things. And, uh, if you ask Bellman, which is responsible for the dynamic programming question, OK, so what is a control problem? Usually, control problem is, is, is posed in full, as an entirely different thing. Okay. So you have a system or a plant, something that you want to control, 
you have some sort of uh, another system, which you call the controller, which is supposed to give inputs to the plant such that, based on some sort of feedback, I measure some sort of output using a sensor, which is usually connected to the, control, uh, to, uh, to the system. So I measure something from the system and generate the controller, essentially, is some sort of translator of the measurement compared to some reference or some desired uh, state of the system. So it, it takes the sensory input and turns it into a control signal. So this is the classical control. How is this related to information? So of course, the classical control problem has many other ways of thinking about it. The most famous one is actually this one, which is uh, coming from a Sartre and Barto book on, on reinforcement learning. Essentially, I can think about this as some sort of a loop, a closed loop between an environment and an agent or an organism essentially the organism is act on the environment with some actions and then receives some information through sensing and again generates uh, something which controls the environment. So any organism, any agent is some sort of a controller which has some sort of sensory inf information and maybe a reward feedback attached to it and has some action that can control the environment. So again, this looks like, like a very different problem. But it, of course, this is also the main problem that the brain is thinking about. I mean, we are, I, not many of you know this picture, of course, or many other talks that I gave. I mean, so there's this loop between the, the agent of the organism and the world is really the fundamental question that we ask in biology. I mean, how do we optimize this cycle, this flow of information through the organism, uh, to, through the brain in the interaction with the organism? Of course, the way we think about it, we, I mean, uh, okay, a lot of people uh, think about it now is actually, okay, you can take this cycle, this loop, and actually turn it into a, a Bayesian model or a Bayesian network where essentially there are two mark of chains or two channels that through processes go here. One is how the world moves and the other one is how the agent moves and they really communicate through perception and action through essentially two channels of information. One of them is what I sense and the other one is the way I act. And actually this particular model is going to play out a very, is a seed to many, many different models that we are thinking about. And eventually, the way I link it with the, the previous information theoretic question is actually, okay, in order to act in the world, you have to develop some sort of an internal representation of your past sensory information in a way which will be useful in the future behavior. So essentially what an organism, any organism should do, any agent should do, is essentially some sort of compressing the past for valuable behavior in the future. So, and, and this is precisely, very precisely, the question that come out of, the, directly out of Shannon's model. I mean, so essentially, if we just turn the past into X and the source into Y and the interpretation into X hat, we have exactly the same problem again. I mean, what is, the compression, the optimal compression of the past sensory inputs that will give me the optimal prediction of the future. And uh, this problem we solved already, I mean, as, as mathematicians used to like to say. I mean, okay, so we transform the problem of optimal behavior into the problem of optimal compression and optimal prediction. And of course, so this is again, the optimal solution of this is in principle coming from, from this uh, bottleneck principle. I mean, how do you minimize the information flow here, such that the information on the future will be as high as you can. Of course, the assumption here is that the information that you have about the future is really required, is valuable for you. Otherwise, maybe you're predicting things that you don't need. Okay, I'll come back to this. Anyway, so this is, this is in my opinion, the deep connection. I mean, so essentially the two problems casted on, on this very high level have exactly the same structure. By the way, this particular problem, how do you compress past observation in order to make valuable prediction is also precisely the fundamental problem of learning. I mean, how do you take samples, extract out of them some sort of a rule which will generalize well out of the sample, which is the fundamental problem of learning theory. So the whole so the three things essentially in my high level view have exactly the same form and exactly the same shape. But of course, life is not that simple. Life is not that simple because this particular problem is, in general, very hard to solve. Uh, it's, it's very hard to solve because, in general, these two source compression or, or compression problem and prediction problem are not separated. 
I mean, this miracle of separation of the channel coding and source coding of Shannon does not repeat itself in general. But there are special cases. <laughs> and the special cases are, 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 so of course, in order to actually make this, solve these self-consistent equations of the prediction and compression, I, I get a non-convex problem. And it's not only not separable, it's hard to solve. There are many, many local solutions, which is bad news for anyone who's doing computational science. <laughs> okay? But as I said, I mean, we, there's hope, or I had hope, because the special cases, I just want to mention them. One of them is the Gaussian case, Gaussian linear case. So again, those of you who know something about information theory know that there's a Gaussian channel and a Gaussian source that are all determined by Gaussian distributions. And if I impose a quadratic distortion, which means I care only about uh, L2 or quadratic distortion, and I have a quadratic cost on my channel, then everything is suddenly becomes simple and solvable. And the separation works. This is also true for control. If I have a linear and quadratic cost and, 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 and uh, reward or whatever, I, I have what we call an LQG or LQR, depending if you know or don't know the channel. And the problem is, again, separable. We have common filter as the compression, and we have optimal control as the prediction, and these are separated. This can be separated. So this, there's, there's some sort of a miracle. Of, of course, it also happened in the Butler problem if it's Gaussian. If, if it's a Gaussian joint, the, a joint XY, then we can essentially solve the problem very easily by some sort of separation, it's in, it, which turned out to be identical to something which you call canonical correlation analysis, or very similar to it. So the Gaussian case was a very big uh, uh, line, light of hope that maybe the problem is not always that difficult, and the question is really how do we generalize it? So I'm more or less out of time, no? Ten minutes, Ten minutes. okay. So I want to give you a very, something which I, I really wanted to have more of it in this, in this talk. Yes, please. Can you elaborate for a second about the, the analogy you're making between the, sort of the internal representation and the action? You're saying that it's essentially the same thing. No, no, I'm not saying that. The internal representation generates the action. The action is some sort of a map of the internal representation. But the instantaneous action depends on internal representation. Internal representation is some sort of compression of your past sensory inputs. But not the same. There's another channel that transforms the internal representation into action. If, there are, if the internal representation is efficient, then this channel should be simple. Uh, and shouldn't be very complicated. I don't need to remember my past actions or my past history. Everything should be a function of the internal representation only. The action is instantaneous. But all the memory of the past and all the relevant information should be kept inside this internal representation. Right. Yes? Just to clarify this point to the, the final thing is that the action is not actually what uh, there is a mix up here between prediction and action. The action is what I call. The prediction, in my view, should be what are the consequences of this action, namely how X will change. Okay. You're so absolutely right. I, 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 and it's a very good comment. And of course, we have a lot to say about it. <laughs> so, so, of course, a prediction is not an action on itself. But a, a, a good prediction, and of course, in some cases, this is everything you do. When you listen to music, you only make predictions <laughs> if you don't play yourself. But this prediction actually is changing, is changing the way your brain addressing it. Of course, there is another layer, which we call active behavior, where you're you're actually doing something following your prediction, and this action can change the world. And that's exactly why we have a feedback, a feedback loop here. So, so that's, that's actually a very important point. I, I call this prediction and action channel, but in principle, they're two separate things. And Roy Fuchs is uh, sitting, sitting there, he spent uh, much of his PhD just making sense of this, this, this distinct, distinction between, between prediction and action. And of course, so we have some sort of a retentive or, or something, an, an agent which is not affecting the world, but actually interacting with it. And it's only the price he's paying is only for its internal state, like, like music listening, for example. Unlike music playing. <laughs> OK. Uh, I, I, really, I really want to, to, to do something more. <laughs> so Sylvia, I'll, I'll answer you later. <laughs> uh, I just want to give you one example. I want, th there's something very funny or so very intriguing that happens in, in, in the science of information in the past uh, recent years. I wanted actually to have a whole session on this topic, but since Susanna was following us uh, later on today, this morning, is going to talk about it. I want you to mention this uh, very nice example, maybe the simplest example 
of the kind of sensing acting system I'm thinking about. So there is, this also has a, a, a very intriguing history, starting from the origins of thermodynamics in the 19th century, and, and the, the, essentially the, the mystery of the second law of thermodynamics. Again, without getting into details, I don't have time for it, but you know that second law of thermodynamics telling us that entropy is increasing in any closed environment, uh, non-decreasing non at least, and, and it's, uh, it's a, a fundamental law of nature in some sense, which we don't, we understand only in some sense statistically. I mean, uh, and uh, this, this second law was challenged, and the first really serious channel series was actually w when made by Maxwell in his uh, 1871 book on statistical, on the, the theory of heat, where he invented something which he called the Maxwell's Dem, which was later called Maxwell's Demon by Lord Kelvin, but never mind. And it, it, some sort of an intelligent being, he called it intelligent being, which is able to make observations. And, and so this demon is sitting here and can look in, into a box which has only one particle in it. And essentially, we insert randomly some sort of a, a barrier inside, movable barrier inside this uh, piston, if you want, inside this box. And then the, the, the demon looks at the box and he identifies if the, the particle is on one side of the box, on the other side of the box, and then he makes an action. So this was his sensory information, observing the location of the particle, and then the action is hanging a mass either on the left or the right of the box, depending on his observation. On his, and then, of course, if the whole thing is heated, it's in, in contact with what we call heat bath, uh, then uh, the random fluctuations of this particle will move the piston or the, the barrier in one direction and not the other one, and this will lift the, the mass which will generate what we call mechanical work. So in principle, Maxwell's demon, and this is actually Zilla's version of Maxwell's demon, was, was able to, is able to extract mechanical work from a heat bath in a fixed temperature, which is against the second law of thermodynamics, and I don't want to tell you why at this point. Five minutes. Okay, so, so what is nice about this uh, observation is that really you can think about Maxwell's demon as some sort of a controller of the environment, which is using, which is simply in a very simple way, turning information into work. I mean, this is really, in my, in my view, uh, is really the fundamental link between these two things. I mean, so he, he, the, this demon is working in some sort of a cycle where he, he makes observation. First of all, he inserts the barrier, which is, can be done more or less adiabatically with no loss of anything. Uh, and then he makes an observation. Then he makes an action, hanging the mass, and then he gets work out of it, and the whole thing can run in cycles, which is very much unlike another famous cycle called the Carnot cycle. This is working in one temperature and extracting work out of the environment in fixed temperature, which is, again, against the second law of thermodynamics. But the miracle is, is that this agent or this organism is actually controlling the environment by only using information. And of course, this, this, uh, this uh, experiment, this uh, Gedanken experiment was, was, uh, was uh, analyzed many, many times by many, many smart people. And eventually, the, the good news is, after really 100 years of debate since the, the 20s where Zillard published this, in the recent years, the last 10 years or so, people have actually built devices which carry out this Zillard uh, machine or engine, information engine. So this is a real, real world, real physics. This actually, the reason I'm emphasizing it, because it really brings us, it takes information from this, you know, world of ideas and, and uh, uh, something which has nothing to do with the real world, as some people think, into, into the physical, concrete physical world. This has a direct connection with fundamental physics. Okay, so I actually wanted to tell you how, we, so how is this Zillard engine can be explained by the bottleneck theory, in some sense, or by, by the, the fact that I'm really, so, but, but I don't really have time for that. I, I just want to mention one other fundamental thing that is also explained by the same framework. This is another, another one of those developments in physics, in fundamental theory of physics and in interaction between physics and computation, which we, we call the cost of erasure of information, or the cost of memory erasure, or the, what we call Landauer principle. And Landauer principle essentially is telling us, again, he invented it, Landauer and then Bennett and many others, uh, uh, in order to save the second law of thermodynamics, 
And you realize that if the second law of thermodynamics is correct, then whenever you erase a bit of information, you pay with heat or you pay with energy. It's again very controversial, although it's considered now more or less a, a, a fact, of, it's still controversial. And, but what is nice about it is that this explains essentially why, what's the problem with Zillard's engine? Because in order for this devil to actually work, you need to erase his memory at every cycle, his one bit of memory at every cycle. And this will give you back the heat that you, the work that you generate. OK. I, I don't have time to go for it, but the same, all, everything, this, all these three things are very nicely connected through uh, uh, the theory that I mentioned to you. I just want one slide with Yair's permission. This is the last time I talk at this meeting. Shannon's trick of turning information into in, in the, the distortion cost trade-off into information trade-off, which is here on the right. So essentially, if I want to know what is the optimal distortion at a given cost, or the optimal cost of the given distortion, I have to transform them through the rate distortion function and through the the uh, channel cost function, the same trick can be extend, extended into something which Bill Bialik and I uh, more or less invented. And it's, it must be true because Bill put it in his book. So anyway, I, I, I managed to convince him at least that this is correct. So essentially, uh, uh, if you want to, if you think about control, the trade-off in control is what is the optimal trade-off between value of actions and cost, value of actions future actions and cost of, of sensing and memory, which is past. So essentially, the past sensing cost and the value cost, this is missing here for some reason, are, are related. And the whole idea of, of our work is that there are two other functions. One of them is how the value is related to future information and how the cost is related to, to cost, to, to past information. But unlike this straight line, comparison of rate to distortion, here there's a much more complicated function, which we call the predictive information of the past and the future, which controls how well we believe. And I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much.